Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Shelley Stewart, Director of the Future of Work Initiative at the Aspen Institute Economic Opportunities Program. It is my great pleasure to welcome you to today's conversation, Good Work in the Gig Economy, Building a Sustainable App-Based Economy. This conversation is part of the Economic Opportunity Program's ongoing opportunity Opportunity in America discussion series, in which we explore the changing state of economic opportunity in the US, what it means for workers, businesses, and communities, and ideas for creating change that promote shared prosperity and race and gender equity. Today, we'll be talking about the gig economy, what it is, who works in it, and what it tells us about the economy and labor market today. With the growth of app-based delivery and driving, uh, like Uber and DoorDash, through the early 2010s, we heard so much about the so-called gig economy in the media, uh, in different news outlets, and we learned a lot about the instability and lack of benefits experienced by so many of these workers. Then during the COVID-19 pandemic over the last few years, App-based gig workers delivered food and groceries to so many people quarantining around the country and drew attention to the lack of sick leave, health insurance, and other benefits for these workers. Today, we're asking, what's going on with gig work now? What has developed in the last few years, and what stayed the same? We have a great panel today to discuss these issues, and I'll introduce them in just a second. Uh, but first, a quick review of our technology. So all attendees are muted. Uh, we welcome your questions. Please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen to submit questions and upvote other questions. Uh, we also encourage you to share your perspective. If you have ideas, examples, or resources uh, related to today's topics, please share those in the chat as well. We also always appreciate your feedback. Uh, so please take a moment to respond to a quick survey, which will open in your browser when you leave this webinar. And we encourage you to tweet about this conversation and share on social channels. Our hashtag is hashtag talk opportunity. If you have any technical issues during this webinar, please message us in the chat or email us at eop.program at aspeninstitute.org. This event is being recorded and will be shared via email and posted on our website. Lastly, closed captions are available for this discussion, uh, and you can click the CC button at the bottom of your screen to activate those. We're going to start today's conversation with a chat about some of the research the Aspen Institute Future of Work Initiative has been doing on gig work with our colleagues at the Workers Lab. Joining me is Adrian Haro, CEO of the Workers Lab. And before Adrian and I have a short conversation, I want to briefly introduce our other speakers that we'll be hearing from. So it is such an honor and privilege to have this panel join us today. And just to put names to faces quickly, uh, I'm going to, to introduce everyone, but you can find full bios on our webpage and learn more about all these fabulous folks. Uh, so we have Lexi Jervis, the Vice President of Impact at Steady. Uh, we'll also be having folks introduce their organization so you get more familiar, familiarity in a little bit. We have Ligia Gualpa, the Executive Director of the Workers' Justice Project, and Will Coleman, the co-founder and CEO of Alto. So looking forward to engaging with all of you very soon. Um, but to get started, Adrian, let's talk about our gig worker learning project a bit. Uh, I've been so excited about this work um, and also learning so much about gig work from this project. And I'm excited to share some of that with our viewers. How about you? Ditto. Excellent. Ditto. <laughs> So we dove into this project a while ago, wondering, you know, what is going on with gig work? We have all of these uh, categories and data from a lot of different sources, but a lot of it was designed a long time ago, before app-based gig work existed, before we had an understanding of all the different ways that people are working. So a lot of the questions were built around a standard 
nine to five type long term employment. Uh, and people don't always work that way. They never have. All people have never worked that way. Um, and then we have all these different sources about gig work. Some of them say this is everything. This is the way of the future. Others say, you know, what? This is nothing. Um, so we figured, why rely on these measures and tools that have been around for decades and designed by, you know, people in academic offices and government institutions? There's a lot of real value in that data, but why don't we just go straight to the workers and ask, what type of work are you doing? Do you think of it as gig work? What are the challenges you face? And what sorts of solutions do you imagine? Uh, so. Adrian, I'm hoping that you could share a little bit about you know, why we're doing this work. Yes. Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you for inviting me to speak here today. Um, why are we doing this work? I, first and foremost, to learn, uh, like Shelly said, there's a bunch of open questions about uh, what gig work even is. And I, we should be doing air quotes when we say gig work because who knows? <laughs> But that's the whole that's the whole crux of the project is who knows and you know who knows is workers gig workers people who are actually doing this work every day and so the reason why we're doing it uh, is to learn more about gig work and the gig economy directly from gig workers themselves um, a year ago. Well, for those of you who don't know what the Workers Lab does, sometimes we give out money when we when we can afford it. <laughs> and over the last few years, more and more of the investments that we've been making had been coming from the so-called gig economy, right? And so as the leader, I was like, God, I got to bone up on what this is, what people are doing, why, all the politics on it, the policy, everything. And that's when I met Shelly, um, who was also looking for some sort of research, participatory research project um, to do. And I said, well, let's go because we're ready to learn. Um, and Shelly wanted to do it in partnership uh, with workers through something called participatory research, which I'm not a researcher, never had had anything to do with it, but now I love it um, because it makes sense to me, participatory research. Um, and I think it's the right way to do it. And so over the last few months, um, my God, uh, to, to get a baseline of what is out there, the gaps, what we know, really to do our own homework. We partnered with a bunch of academic researchers, government leaders, business leaders, Likia, Lexi, other folks in the space uh, to help us put out some knowledge, some literature about what, what existed out there so we can get our ducks in a row. And then over the last, I'd say, four or five months, we've been engaged, as Shelly knows, in the heart and soul of this project. And as Lika knows, and as Lexi knows, uh, who have all been partners with us in helping us focus group and do listening sessions with gig workers themselves across every sector, industry, geography. Because for me, um, my working definition of gig worker is super broad. So I'm talking about everything from a Uber driver to a farm worker, to a sex worker, to a burlesque performer. Um, and we've talked to all of them <laughs> pretty much. <laughs> and we're not done yet. We're right at the end. We've done about 16 or 17 of these, probably gonna do about four or five more. And it has been probably the most rewarding work I've done at the Workers Lab and excited to keep going, Shelly. Yeah. Um, and as, as Adrian's describing, we're still very much engaging in these conversations and then in line with participatory methods, which really take the, the drivers, the steering wheel of the research and give it to the participants, um, allow them, the people who are the source of knowledge, the source of understanding here to drive the project, not us. You know, we are not experts in so many of these types of work. You know, I've been a gig worker now and again, I know about that experience, but I don't know about, you know, all of the other folks that we're learning from. They should be the ones developing the questions, identifying the themes, coding those transcripts. Um, and and so we'll be re-engaging with those folks um, and, and giving them control of this work. Uh, and so, you know, I'm going to mention a couple things that I've heard, but these are not findings. Um, the findings will come after the next step of analysis um, that, again, is in the hands of, of our participants. Um, but one thing I've heard a lot about in these conversations is how hard it is to deal with near constant instability of a lot of this work, instability of wages, of when work is available, um, and of how external factors, things like the weather, impact work in a very real way. 
another thing that's stood out to me is uh, how much folks want to connect with other people. Uh, and I find this really relatable in, you know, to my own work, uh, whether it's about coming together to work for change or to share experiences or build a version of some, a vision of something different. Uh, these connections are really important to people no matter how and where they're working. Uh, but they can also be really difficult when work is dispersed happening in people's cars and people's homes on computers. Uh, and so that's a, a challenge that we're hearing, hearing a lot about. Uh, so I'm excited to, to really continue to learn from this work, uh, see where we go, see what we're able to learn, see how big we can make this. Uh, and, and on that note, Adrian, I'm hoping you can share with folks a little bit about where we see this headed. Shelly, you're so smart. This point that you're making about, um, yeah, it's true. When we do these focus groups, like folks are really excited to get together. Um, I don't know how that lends itself to the to the participatory research, but it lends itself to feeling happy, I think, because the the workers are disaggregated in nature for the most part. So when they come together, it's a pretty amazing feeling. Uh, but now I'll talk about what we're going to do. Um, so as Lihia and Lexi know, um, we're going to wrap up these focus groups, um, right? And Shelly and the people who are really smart at this stuff are going to do some analysis on their own first. Then, keeping in line with this pattern of participatory and bringing people together, the hope and expectation, if we can get the money, <laughs> is to bring everybody back together. Um, so Lihia, uh, all the workers that Lihia is working with that we spoke to, all the people from the freelancers union that we spoke to, all the people from uh, Unemployed Workers United that we spoke to. God, I'd love to bring these folks together um, and help and have them help us make sense of what we heard. Was it right? Did we get it wrong? Did we get it right? Then I'd like to bring that same group back together and have them help us design some policy. What is something we can all agree on uh, that applies to all of us, um, despite sector industry geography? And then I think we got to build something. Um, I don't know what that is. Lihia is going to help us <laughs> figure out what some sort of national infrastructure looks like uh, for these workers uh, that was built by them, informed them, designed by them. Um, and I'm just really excited. It's going to take a little while and it's going to take a lot of money. Um, so if you've got any, uh, we'll take it. <laughs> Thanks, Shelly. Yeah, well, thank you. That's a really exciting note to kind of wrap up our conversation about this research project on. You know, I've never been so excited to be in the backseat of a project as I have been for the last couple of years that we've been taking this on. Uh, and, and another thing that this project really points to is how many questions still exist about this type of work. Uh, there are things we do know right now about how to make it better, and there's a lot we don't know. Um, and to build on both of those conversations, what we what we can do, what is happening, and what we still need to know, uh, let's bring in the rest of our colleagues to this conversation and start the the panel discussion. Uh, so to start things off, uh, as a way of getting to know everyone a bit, this is a question I I like to ask folks working in this space. Um, have you yourself ever done gig work? Uh, what did you do? Tell us a little bit about it. I'm purposely leaving that as a vague term. You can define it however you would like. Uh, and so let's just go around. Um, and Lexi, I'm gonna go ahead and start with you. Thanks, Shelly, and thank you so much for having me today. Really excited uh, to share this panel. So yes, I've done gig work. I've not done app-based gig work specifically, but um, during my academic career, when I was doing my PhD, uh, many of you probably know how small the living stipends are <laughs> to live on when you're doing academic work. So I did a lot of project-based like freelance gig work to sustain myself during my academic career. So I had a really good front seat into all the issues that come with doing that kind of work, including paying your own taxes, figuring out how much taxes, not having health insurance, all, all of that stuff. So uh, not app-based gig work, but some exposure for sure. Yeah, thanks for sharing. Uh, Lihia, let's go to you. Yeah, so, um, well, thank you for, for having me um, as, as I think the same experience as Le Lexi. Uh, I haven't done app-based um, gig work, but throughout my 
my my career, whether it was in college or just in other tradition, non-traditional jobs, um, it's very common to do gig work, especially among uh, communities who have to rely on multiple jobs while trying to, um, you know, uh, eat, whether it's uh, going to college or just trying to make ends meet um, at the end of the day. So um, very familiar with different type of gig work that you do, whether it's in 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 low wage sectors, uh, particularly. Yeah, thanks so much. Uh, Will, let's go to you. Hey, Shelly. Yeah, Will Coleman. I'm the, uh, as you mentioned, uh, founder and CEO of Alto. Um, I'm a five star uh, Uber driver, so uh, can can say that I've I've um, been not only a, a, a an app based gig worker, but I think I'm pretty good at it. Great. It's excellent. We have some first-hand app-based driver experience on our panel. Uh, and last, but certainly not least, Adrian. You know, I haven't, but I was, um, but my parents did. My mom was a seamstress and a dry cleaner and um, my dad was a janitor. And so I, while I don't have first-hand experience, I, I understand it well um, because I, I grew up around it and understand um, both its joys and, and, and its limitations. Um, but no, haven't done it myself, Shelly. Yeah, and and building on this wide uh, variety of experiences, um, I've also done a few different types of gig work. Something probably a lot of my colleagues don't even know is that I play the accordion, uh, and for several years bounced around and in evenings would would pick up gigs, uh, which I mentioned partially because it's interesting and fun, but also it reminds us that this term gig has been around a lot longer than apps. These ways of working are not new. Uber did not invent them, um, but the apps have sort of brought them literally into the hands of, of so many folks. Uh, and so now we're going to dive a little bit more deeply into what all of our panelists are doing now uh, and the folks and workers that you work with on a daily basis. Uh, so now, Lithia, let's start with you and tell us a bit about Workers Defense Project uh, and who are the workers that you represent? Yeah, uh, so with Workers Justice Project, I've been with the organization since 2010, particularly organizing gig workers, um, those that were in the construction industry as day laborers or domestic workers, which traditionally happens to be gig work as well. Um, so Workers Justice Project has been organizing um, a, through different organizing strategies with the mission to really make um, transform the industries into jobs that are dignified, um, are protected, um, and workers have worker representation. And since 2010, we've been organizing gig workers from construction um, to app, most recently in the past three years, app delivery workers. And we have been doing this through uh, workplace organizing, um, policy innovation as well, and thinking also about how we build interconnection with other issues um, that are front and center um, of the workers' rights movement. And I think one of the most beautiful things about organizing uh, or my history of organizing is uh, realizing that workers' rights is so interconnected with everything, right? Workers' rights is environmental justice, workers' rights is health justice, uh, workers' rights, it is uh, human rights uh, um, justice as well. So, and I think we have done incredible work about making sure that workers across many industries that are low wage in our gig work um, are at the front and center on building an economy that is just and dignified for all workers. And we're here, I think, in this new era, not only fighting for workers' justice, but I would say also defending um, the, the rights that uh, historically, the the labor movement um, has been has been able to secure for all workers, right? Um, so we are in the front lines defending um, a, a, a decades of historic labor protections that has existed um, and continues to exist um, in this in 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 the country. But right now, I think we're we're facing a crisis moment where uh, we find a new era of gig work where workers are completely being excluded from basic labor protections. And I'm excited to do this with incredible people like all of you who are thinking about how we transformed and make sure gig work a 
a job that is dignified for all workers. Yeah, thanks so much for telling us about Workers' Justice Project and also for grounding this whole conversation in big, you know, something bigger than gig work. This is about human rights. This is about how people live and exist in, in our economy. Uh, Will, let's go to you next. Uh, you lead a company called Alto. Uh, could you tell us a bit about your company and what inspired you to start it? Yeah, thanks, Shelley. Um, at Alto, I started Alto back in, in 2018, and we started the company to really uh, redefine ride hailing. Uh, we wanted to create a opportunity uh, that was better for drivers and better for passengers. Uh, in doing so, we really turned the traditional uh, ride hail model on its head. Uh, we do not use independent contractors at Alto. Uh, all of our drivers are W-2 employees. Uh, that work for our company, and we provide all of those drivers with a company-owned vehicle that uh, we keep clean, safe, well-maintained. Uh, and so our drivers show up every day uh, with one mission, which is to drive safely and provide great customer service to our customers. Uh, through that, we're able to offer the, the safest, most consistent, and highest quality experience for drivers and passengers. And we believe that that is a, a huge differentiator in the space, something that creates better outcomes for, for both sides um, and ultimately a better outcome for, for our business. Um, and so we're really excited to continue to grow. We now employ almost 2000 people across the United States. We operate in five cities, Dallas, Houston, Los Angeles, Miami and Washington DC. And uh, we're growing really quickly and really excited to be part of this conversation as well as many others about how uh, alternative models can and, and will work to drive uh, great outcomes for everyone involved. Yeah, thanks so much. Excited to continue to hear more through this, this conversation. Um, Adrian, we'll go to you next uh, to tell us a bit about the Workers Lab and what draws you to thinking about gig work. So I'm just reading all these wonderful comments in the comment section. Um, the Workers Lab, and I'm also still uh, I need to see you play that accordion one day. <laughs> the um, the Workers Lab, for those of you who don't know, was founded uh, a little while ago uh, out of SEIU. And the, the big idea was let's throw money at something that could serve as both a hub and an engine uh, for innovation in the labor movement. Um, right. And the way that I have, I, I wasn't there right at the beginning, but the way that I have interpreted that purpose and ran with it is um, understanding like very... That it's 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 very it's a very radical purpose. Our job at the Workers Lab is to question everything in the labor movement, everything in the power structures of the labor movement, um, to experiment, to be open to to both success and to failure. Um, and I think we all share that sort of ethos here on this call. Um, our job is to demonstrate to the powers that be in this country um, that there is another way, uh, better ways uh, to take care of every worker in this country, not just the ones on a W-2. Everybody deserves to feel safe, healthy, and secure, and have power in this country. And we can do that. Um, what draws me to gig workers? You know, I don't have a fancy answer to this. I, I, I think, as I was preparing for this, I think what it is is like, I have always been an underdog. I'm an underdog. That's it. <laughs> I've always been on the outside trying to poke in, right, my whole life. Um, and if you think about uh, if you think about this, how this thing is structured, right? There are two major federal labor laws. The smartest people in the country admit that those labor laws are weak, um, right? That they're weak laws, and that they are exclusive laws, right? There's millions of people who exist out on the outside of them, and I ex I identify with that. Um, we've got to fix that. Uh, folks need help, and I I'm here to help people. That's all I'm doing. And I have uh, some money <laughs> and some friends, and my job is to help. And I identify with that feeling of uh, being right on the outside, but not being let in. And I think um, I want to let everybody in. I certainly want to try. Um, and so that's what draws me. And I like solving problems. And boy, oh boy, are there problems to solve in this part of the economy. And by the way, I think, you know, the more that I learn about the gig economy, a lot of the problems that we're trying to solve with regard to benefits access and administration, right? Verifying income, Lexi and Steady, right? Organizing technology, 
so much of what we can learn in the gig economy applies to the economy more broadly, to jobs on the W-2, on the W-2 side of, of things, right? Um, I just think it's rich, 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 rich with learning. Um, and that's what that's what takes me there. Yeah, thank you so much for that. Uh, and Adrian made brief mention of Steady. So Lexi, that's the company you're currently at. Can you tell us a bit about what Steady does and the workers who use it? Yeah, and thank you, Adrian, for the, the pre-intro. Um, so SETI is a mission-driven fintech that helps gig workers access public benefits through simplifying the process to verify their income. So we really started in 2017 as a consumer app that was intended to help gig workers better work and earn by accessing community data around better shifts or work opportunities. And then in 2020, as we all know, the pandemic hit, and we really saw a fundamental pain point for gig workers emerge. So specifically at the onset of the pandemic, these workers were eligible for unemployment for the first time, right? Typically gig workers are left out of unemployment because they don't have a named employer. And in the CARES package, specifically pandemic unemployment assistance, these workers were actually included for the first time, which was a, a remarkable policy movement, but the problem was in its implementation, right? So the policy was passed, but gig workers were struggling to actually access unemployment benefits. Uh, we ran an analysis with Andy Stetner, who's now at the DOL. He used data from our platform, and he found that workers were waiting upwards of 16 weeks or more to actually access the pandemic unemployment benefits they, that they should have received. Um, so this was a real pain point that became clear. And as we saw it, the issue was really around proving or showing their income in order to be able to receive this benefit. This is something that gig workers hadn't applied for before, and traditionally, um, income verification is done through a W-2 pay stub or a tax statement. And by law, 1099 or gig workers are not required to actually receive uh, a pay stub. And with really volatile and inconsistent earnings, their, their tax returns from last year are often out of date. So really they were struggling to show their income and they were cobbling together screenshots of receipts and rides done and bank statements, right? And putting together ad hoc profits and loss statements to be able to show their income. And that's what workers were doing. On the other side, caseworkers were really struggling too because they had no systematized way to understand this kind of income. They were used to looking at a standardized pay stub um, or a tax return. And they were also struggling to understand this income to verify it, to be able to give benefits out. So uh, as Adrian mentioned, we partnered with the Workers Lab, with our, our friends at the Workers Lab to develop something called the Income Passport, which is a user-directed user permission solution that helps gig workers showed their income just like a W-2 worker would. Um, they actually connect their bank accounts or work platforms, show the income for the reporting period, and can submit that directly to the state caseworker. And we did some work in Alabama and Louisiana during the pandemic specifically with this, and it helped uh, lessen the time to receive benefits from three weeks to one day. So we're really proud of that work, and I think that's the, the crucial way that we're supporting gig workers. Uh, thank you so much for that. Um, and that really is a great transition to kind of the next set of questions around what some of the challenges that gig workers face are, you know, in our intros, both our personal intros and intro to organizations, uh, we have a huge range of types of work that kind of fall under this broad umbrella. And with that are a lot of different challenges. Uh, so, Liha, I'm hoping that you can kind of build on what Lexi shared. Um, think about the workers in New York that you work with, uh, and and could you share more about some of the experiences that that you hear about? Yeah, and we particularly organize gig workers in the app delivery industry. Um, and when we talk about gig work, just wanted to emphasize that we're talking about um, workers in in many industries, right? And in their working conditions, um, in their experiences, um, differentiate between depending not only the cities um, or estates where they're located, but also based on the industries that they're working on. And there are some common factors um, that um, and common experiences that they shared. And I can share a little bit about the experience in New York, particularly where we organize. Um, we're organizing app delivery workers um, in New York, specifically in New York City. Uh, we're talking about uh, about 65,000 app delivery workers who do 
um, de app-based delivery work um, throughout the five boroughs, all the way from the Bronx, all the way down to Brooklyn. Um, most, uh, what we define them as deliveristas, a combination um, of, of the work that they do, some of the deliveristas, in my, actually just to highlight, New York City is probably not one of, one of the largest city in the country where uh, most delivery workers do this work on e-micromobility devices. Uh, most of the work um, is done on e-bikes, um, e-scooters, um, especially, I think we're one of the cities leading that future in showing to the world of how it is possible to build a new future where workers can do and work um, using e-micromobility devices. So going back, 65,000 deliveristas across New York City. Uh, we recently did a, a research um, with Cornell University and Workers Justice where we find out that um, most of the deliveristas or app delivery workers that we interview, about 85% uh, reported that they were working full time. And that just tells a story that this is for many del delivery workers in New York. This is not just gig work. It's sometimes and majority of the times happens to be full time work. Um, the second thing that I want to share about who are the people we organize, have majority are are immigrant workers uh, in New York City who come from all over the world um, and happens to be a, from Latin America, South Africa, East Africa, South Asia, East Asia. It's it's a huge immigrant community. Um, and it's it's and the other one is we're talking about immigrants who are just not single um, are single individuals, but we're talking about working families uh, who do this work. And it happens to be one of those industries where most delivery workers rely on and during the pandemic specifically, um, started relying as their main, uh, to, to actually bring a main source of income, um, but it brings different challenges. And some of the experiences of deliveristas oh, uh, in New York City happens to be that about half of that industry have experienced accidents or injuries without having health insurance. We're talking about deliveristas that about 69% of those have reported that they have experienced um, some sort of punishment uh, or lack of transparency working with the companies, one of them including not being paid on time. And the other story is that delivery workers in New York are making sub minimum wages, are actually making half of New York City's minimum wage. We're talking New York City minimum wage is $15 an hour. New York, we find out that deliveristas without including tips, um, the average deliverista was making $7.87. And that's sub minimum wages for a city where, you know, we're, we're dealing with economic crisis, where housing, um, it's it's limited and um, there's many other issues. So those are the some some of that those experiences of app delivery workers earning sub minimum wages, exposed to some of the most dangerous working conditions without access to workers' compensation or healthcare insurance. And some of these deliveristas happen to be working full time, and that tells a story that for some. It's not just gig work. This is full-time work in an online platform economy that are trying to make ends meet. And that's the community that we're organizing in New York City. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, and Adrian, I'm gonna turn to you. Uh, and does what Lexi and Ligia describe resonate with our research um, and what you see across the workers lab? Absolutely. Um, spitting image, actually. The one thing that I've been, um, uh, there are two things actually that I've been really struck by and think about a lot after doing these. Um, I've, I've facilitated a couple of them on, my, on myself. Well, not by myself. Leah helped me with the Spanish one because my Spanish isn't what it used to be. Um, but anyway, the two, the two things that I'm coming away from are, one, there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of focus on I think in the labor movement around on like uh, um, the challenges inside of this work, which we've talked about a lot here, right? But what we hear also in these focus groups is that when you talk about the work itself, right? Um, folks like it, some folks like it uh, and many folks take pride in it. Um, and so, you know, I used to work in government a long time ago now. 
it's, but I just consider my whole job to, to like serve, right? And so like, if that's what we're hearing from people, that they like the work of it all, things need to be better. Then as a servant of the public, as servants of the public, we have an obligation to get to work and try and help them create that reality. Try and create a kind of gig work that is good, like, like Will is doing. And like, we'll talk about a little bit how we're doing, right? Um, that's the one thing. There's pride, an immense amount of pride in getting on that moto and driving through New York City. They love it. Um, and that's something that you don't get in the research. It's not something that you see in the news. Um, but there's something there that we have to respond to. The other thing that we're here that I that I've been struck by is um the weather. You mentioned it at the top. Um, you know, there's a lot of the, the issue is fraught. Let's just say it in the news, everywhere, boom, 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 boom. Right? Well, when you talk to it, that nobody can agree on anything. I'm telling you, across the board in these focus groups, everybody agrees that the weather is a problem for most gig workers. <laughs> right? Especially right now, it's hot as hell outside. My God, we need shade. We need water in the winter. We still need shade. We need a heater. You know, this is like something that we can organize policy around because all these infrastructure dollars coming down the pike. My God, what a way to bring us together and to work on policy with that as a starting point. I feel it in my gut that we can really design something beautiful with workers on something that affects all of them. Um, anyway, yes, Shelly, it does resonate with me. It, it matches and there's a lot for us to do um, based on what, what, what folks are telling us, for sure. Thank you. And we're about to transition to some of those things that we can do, where our solution's headed. Uh, but, but first, Will, I'm going to turn to you in this section about some of the, the real challenges that we're facing. Uh, and as a business leader, could you tell us about some of the challenges that you face in offering good jobs through an app-based platform? Yeah, Shelly, I mean, I know we're a little bit behind time, so I'll, I'll try to be quick, but I, I actually think the, the good news here is I think we all agree. I, I agree with Lahia that there are a lot of challenges. I agree with Adrian that there's also a lot of opportunity. I think that the, the challenge we face is really one of trade-offs. And I think the thing that we see in this space is that life is a series of trade-offs, right? Um, and, and you can get one thing, but Oftentimes, that means giving up something else. And here in this space in particular, um, I do hear from our workers, from, from people that we that we interview and, and attempt to hire, well, I really love all of the things that you're offering, a steady income, not instability, a, a, a certainty of, of income, not uncertainty, a connection, a team, support, not loneliness. Um, but... I also really love the flexibility that I have in this other world. And you can't offer me that, or you can't offer me the same level of that because I need to sign up for a schedule because, you know, uh, and, and, and if, if I don't show up for my schedule, you're going to um, punish me or, or, or potentially, you know, over time, if I'm not reliable enough, I won't have a job anymore. And these are, these are, I believe this is really at the crux of, of the issue is, um, I do think we've proven it also, there are real solutions, there are real better ways, but there are also real trade-offs. And I think coming to the table and having a, a, a more balanced, frankly, discussion about what those trade-offs look like, you can demand this, but reasonably that also requires giving on this. And, um, and, and the, the, that's, that's what we're trying to do every day, to create the best possible solution while recognizing that uh, perfect probably isn't going to happen. And, and so in order to make my business work, in order to make my the, the solution work for, for, for us, for passengers, for drivers, there are trade-offs that I have to make. I need to utilize the, it costs me more to employ people than to not. I need to get something for that, or I can't survive in a, in a, in a business context, right? And so in exchange, for that extra cost, what I need is um, some level of predictability for us. I need to be able to know that people are going to show up to their shift so that I can count on that, so that I can deliver my product to my customer. 
And I, I'm willing to find ways to create flexibility within some framework, but it can't be, I wake up this morning and I decide I'm not going to work for Alto today, or I want to work tomorrow and I didn't tell you about that until, you know, this afternoon. There, there's, there just are trade-offs. And I think that is the challenge that, um, that we see every day in this space, which really balances the opportunity that people like this. Uh, that there, there are aspects of the work that people like, but there's also real challenges to solve and we need to make decisions, um, tough ones sometimes about what is the right balance. Yeah, thank you so much for that perspective and highlighting some of the complexities and nuances of this conversation. Uh, we're we're going to pivot a bit to looking forward to thinking about strategies and successes for creating good jobs uh, in in the gig economy. Uh, and and Will, I'm going to turn back to you to start us off. Um, you know, based on on what you just shared, uh, what do you think other companies can learn from your experience? What would you like to tell other companies? Yeah, I would like to say, look, I mean, I think we're proving that that um, there is there is a set of trade-offs, a set of a set of decisions that can be made that we believe are are you know better for everyone, um, and that with that we can provide better opportunities to workers in this in our case employees, better solutions to passengers, in this case you know uh, our customers, and uh, and 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 better outcomes for the company too, by the way. I mean, what we are trying to do is build a more profitable solution in a space where let's be honest, our competitors have spent $37 billion without earning a single dollar of profit, returning a single dollar of profit to their investors. And that's that's just unsustainable. That's unsustainable for everyone. Um, and, and certain people have won and certain people have lost. <laughs> uh, you could say in many cases, actually consumers have won a lot with very low prices, access to, to, to products and services that that probably shouldn't be priced in the way that they are. Um, and, and workers in some cases have won too, have, have earned more and been given subsidies uh, that, that otherwise wouldn't have been supported by the revenue that these companies generate. Um, and so, but at the same time, the, the structure feels broken to us. It feels like at the end of the day, it is unsustainable for everyone. And so what we're trying to do is break that cycle. Uh, and 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 prove that again it is possible, but there are trade offs. I mean, one way that we like to talk about this, and one big pushback that we get is, well, you're you're more expensive, you know, and so your product serves a different different need, a different customer base, um, and and that is true. Our average fare is is um, one and a half times our competitors. Uh, a lot of that is driven by the the length of our trip and not the actual base pricing, but. Um, the impact of that is that, you know, we are able to, to employ people. We're able to offer consistent, competitive, I believe, compelling, not only cash compensation, but benefits and 401k matching plan and obvious things like workers compensation and sick pay, which are policy driven. Um, and, and then, but, you know, in exchange for that, we, we have to earn a higher, a higher return. Um, and, and so a lot of times I think, again, some of these big issues get lost in the, in the discussion because it's, well, we want more, or we, well, we love this and it's going to have an impact on consumers. The reality is that these problems have been solved in other industries in, for a long time and, and all industry has problem, you know, but we don't typically solve them by, uh, totally abandoning the the kind of structures that exist and the policy that does exist to support workers and to support consumers. We have food deserts across our country, um, places where it's very difficult to get to a grocery store. Um, one way that we could solve that is we could allow Walmart or Safeway or think of any company you want to use independent contractors that only get paid when they're actively checking someone out. That would lower their costs and it would lower their cost of entering new, new places. They would be able to serve more consumers. I don't think that's the right answer. This needs to be a public and a private solution. We need to allow private companies to do a certain, and following a certain structure to, to compete fairly with the same rules. 
And then we also need to improve things like public transit, like access to other mobility services to solve for a set of consumers and, and a set of economic opportunities and economic development that makes sense. The MTA in New York, the, the Metropolitan Transportation Association, they lost pre-pandemic $12 billion a year. There's a good reason that they do that because it creates economic opportunity for the city. If you actually think about that, it, it really puts Uber, Uber's uh, losses in perspective. They, they lost $4 billion in the same year serving every city across the, the world. So it actually is quite efficient and, and they have improved the, the, the performance of historical solutions, but that can't be the way that this works long-term. Uh, and so that, that's you know, what we're trying to prove, that we're trying to prove that you know, as a private enterprise, we can do it this way. We need to partner with other others, public enterprise to, to solve for the other challenges that we won't be able to solve. And we wanna create a solution, again, I mean, circling back to the beginning, that just better, we believe, for everyone. Yeah, thank you so much for that. Lots to, to think about. Uh, Lihia, Workers' Justice Project is pursuing a few different strategies to improve gig work, uh, from organizing workers to pursuing policy change and, and more. <clears throat> uh, and I'm hoping you can tell us about a recent win or success that you've had that shows a little bit about how we can move forward towards better, better gig jobs. Yeah. And well, in New York, over the past three years, Los Deliberistas Unidos have been organizing to transform the app delivery industry in New York City. Um, and in 2020, Los Deliberistas Unidos fought tirelessly um, to actually secure um, labor protections. And we were able to win six labor standards that are historic in, the, in this app deliver industry. And that includes from the right to use the customer bathroom at the restaurants, to set the limits on delivery distances, to transparency on their tips, to the right to uh, earn a fair paid um, in the app delivery industry. Um, and in addition to the setting some basic labor standards, uh, we also have done a groundbreaking partnership with the city to build the first Deliverista hubs um, that we're in, in actually in our way to, to, to build up to actually also build the right infrastructures that this new workforce deserves and needs to stay safe in our streets. Um, and actually the minimum pay is the current fight that we were having because it was supposed to be implemented and enacted in early this year. But um, as you all know, uh, we're, we're touching the packets of multi-billion dollar corporations who are uh, fighting back uh, using legal strategies and every anti-union organizing tactic to make sure that they don't have to actually pay a livable wage to live workers. But we're excited because this is exactly what we're trying to do in New York, making sure that workers who have been completely excluded from basic labor protections, are act we can expand those ba basic labor protections to workers um, who deserve, especially because many of them happen not only to be gig workers, but majority happen to be essential workers who have who were essential during the pandemic and continue to be essential um, through through our cities as as we continue to experience different crises, right? From climate change to um, economic um, uh, and transportation crisis across the city. And we're excited to be leading that effort from expanding labor protections, um, building the right infrastructure, but the fight doesn't end there. Um, this is an ongoing fight uh, to make sure that we have full control of the narrative. And I just wanna end there. I think something that these multi-billion dollar companies have done amazing is about building a narrative that uh, on what gig work is and really means for workers um, in a way that has divided workers and has divided our community about what the fight is really about. Um, and companies have been good about building a narrative that it's false and it's untrue about the reality of workers and what workers really deserve to live in our city. And that's what we're fighting too across the city. And we're excited to do this with all of you 
Um, and I think this is why this research is so important because it's about telling the story of workers. It's about actually telling what's actually happening in the industry and what really workers want. Thank you so much. Uh, and Lexi, I'm going to turn to you. Uh, and if you can share with us what you've learned from your research at Steady about the types of resources and supports that gig workers need. Yeah, thank you for that, Shelley. I think, you know, we can all agree, it sounds like here that one of the big issues with gig work is the lack of benefits that are afforded to this type of work, right? That's a big part of what makes it precarious. And I think sometimes, you know, my previous research during my dissertation was on portable benefits specifically. I think portable benefits is a big part of the conversation, but it means that a lot of the focus goes to benefits that are work type dependent, right? So you re require an employer to pay in on your behalf, like unemployment, retirement, workers' comp, all of that. Um, but I think what, you know, my work at SETI has shown me is that there are a series of public benefits that are not work type dependent, like SNAP and Medicaid and TANF are some really well-known ones. There's smaller ones like LIHEAP, the low income, uh, I just forgot what the acronym stood for, and ACP, the Affordable Connectivity, that never happens program. Those are some of the smaller benefits um, that, thank you, thank you, Laura, for helping me out in the chat. Um, low income energy assistance program, home energy assistance program. These are benefits for which gig workers currently are eligible for, right? They're not dependent on an employer paying in on your behalf, but I think the issue is awareness, first of all, and barriers to access in actually doing the application. So I think some of the work that Lith Lithia is talking about where you're organizing workers and centralizing them, that's one of the things that can be done with organizing is helping to make workers aware of the, you know, the full suite of public benefits that they're actually eligible for, you know, if their incomes qualify them. And then I think the second thing is actually helping with benefit applications. So, you know, interventions like I was talking about, the income passport is intended to make it easier for workers to prove their income. You know, there might even be more needed one on one support that's been proven really successful. And I think a huge part of, you know, this, this aggregated workforce who doesn't have access to a central system that is helping them understand what's out there, that's a crucial thing that can be done with organizing. And there is this large set of public benefits that these workers are currently eligible for and should be receiving if their income qualifies them for, that I think the conversation, while work type dependent benefits are incredibly important, I think that's a big part of the conversation that's missing. And we should do everything we can to make sure that gig workers know about these benefits and have an easy time accessing them. Yeah, thank you so much for that, Lexi. Uh, and then, Adrian, we're going to turn to you. You know, a lot of this conversation has focused on private sector employers um, and what their role is in, in this whole conversation. Uh, and Workers Lab is looking also at the public sector um, as having a role in creating and maintaining good gig jobs. Uh, so can you tell us a bit more about your work there and what you're learning? I can try. <laughs> it's going to be hard, but I'll do it. No, I'm just kidding. Okay, so here's what we're doing. So if you've ever used, anybody watching has ever used a TaskRabbit thing to like get a TV mounted or whatever in your home. Um, Why does everybody use TaskRabbit to get a TV mounted? <laughs> whatever. Like the number one job on TaskRabbit? <laughs> to Why assemble you? your, I don't know, your stool for the whatever, the bar that you have in your home. Um, so think about for a second, bear with me here, think about, um, that kind of technology, right? That is essentially a scheduling technology, um, housed inside a pro worker entity, like one of America's fabulous job centers, which I believe in deeply, um, able to be regulated, um, by folks who live in the community, um, that's what we're trying to create by and large. We have invested in a piece of technology that is British out of a British nonprofit called uh, Modern Markets for All. Um, that is a version of that technology. Uh, nobody owns it. There are no shareholders, nothing. Um, completely worker-centered and continues to be now that the workers lab has sort of brought it into its uh, existence and has wrapped workers' arms around it, frankly, to help us break it, make it better, build it again, whatever. We've got the technology. We are now about to launch pilots in the fall. 
in Chicago, Portland, and Oakland um, with a bunch of really amazing local community leaders, mostly public sector leaders uh, and, and CBOs. Um, uh, some of them will serve as the house, the entity that houses that technology, right? They become the de facto employer of record, which is how this be becomes quality, flexible work or good gig work because it's actually W-2 work, right? The innovation is, is the technology is fine. Task Rabbits is probably better to be honest with you, but ours is fine and good enough. <laughs> it works, right? The innovation really is on getting local government uh, getting community-based organizations to innovate around the way that we pass out W-2 work in this country. All that's happening is we're passing it out in smaller slices, also known as gigs, <laughs> right? We can do it. They're going to do it in Chicago, in Portland, and Oakland. Of course, you have to create a market. On one side, you have to market that opportunity for good gig work to workers, right? Who either want it, for whatever reason, none of our business, or need it because they have other responsibilities like caretaking, right? They should have the option to either use it as a temporary solution while they find longer term employment or whatever. On the other side, you need to build a body of trusted employers in the region who say, okay, I'm gonna agree to pay a slightly higher premium um, for this pool of workers uh, to do flexible work that I know and I know these workers have been vetted by the job center or the workforce board. They, I'm gonna reduce turnover because if anybody on this call knows, right? Gig workers are notoriously prone to moving, doing other jobs, whatever, right? That's just part of the gig. So what we are trying to do here, and I'll stop talking when I say this, is demonstrate uh, with partners in the public sector and in community-based organizations in these three regions, a public option. Uh, for what we're calling good gig work uh, as an alternative, as another option to the options that are out there now, which are largely private. Uh, and I, I don't know uh, what's gonna happen here other than we're gonna learn a lot and we're gonna help people. Um, and we're doing that in partnership with uh, Shelly and a bunch of local leaders all over the country. Be on the lookout for an announcement about that. Um, and if you wanna donate again, uh, hit me up. <laughs> Thanks so much for that, Adrian. Uh, one of the real themes of this whole conversation has been that all gig work is not the same, not only in different types of work, whether it's, you know, playing musical gigs versus delivery via an app versus, you know, other types of work, but also within each of those sectors, there's a huge range. Um, I do want to, to let everyone know that uh, actually tomorrow there'll be some ratings of a lot of different gig companies released, uh, put out by Fair Work, which is a global organization that looks at working conditions in the app-based economy uh, and, and how fair they are based on uh, Pretty, pretty high standards of working conditions. Uh, and so the first set of ratings for apps in the US, again, being released tomorrow, I believe they're having a, a launch event and we can put that uh, in the chat for folks to, to tune in and learn more about that and get a deeper understanding of some of these differences within this world. Um, so, you know, we've talked about a whole whole range of things, really want to thank our panelists. Um, and we're going to now shift to some audience questions. Uh, we really appreciate how many of you have tuned in and also offered offered thoughts and and raised some questions. Um, so we're not going to have time for all of them, but I'm going to try to prioritize those that have been upvoted or that variations of the same question have been asked. Um, one that has come up quite a few times is this question around benefits for gig workers. What can we do or what successful models exist for offering benefits to these workers? Uh, so are there any of our panelists who want to jump in first for this one? Yeah, I, I think um, I'll, I'll jump in there quickly. I mean, I'd kind of return back to some of the comments I made earlier. I think what we, we at Alto have a really what we believe you know to be robust, competitive, compelling, complete compensation package that includes uh, benefits to our, our people. I think um, it's it, it all translates to sustainability and trade-offs again, right? I mean, Lexi mentioned some public programs that help. 
But the reality is, um, in many in many gig uh, work scenarios, um, the lack of things like workers compensation of uh, sick pay of unemployment. I mean, we talked about the the pandemic assistance, but that was gov that nobody paid for that. You know, the government printed money to make it happen. It's not sustainable. Um, and I think this is at the core of, of what we how we need to solve this problem is thinking about sustainable solutions. When a current gig worker is injured on the job, they're in an accident, they're bitten by a dog, they fall. Um, they're receiving public assistance. They're going to a public hospital. We, everyone in the United States is paying for that. And, and the people that aren't, the, the, what's not paying for that is people that are using the product or running the company. And so you're getting a cheaper delivery, you're getting a cheaper ride because uh, a lot of these costs that are real and that, that need to be covered are not today. Uh, and, and what that means just on the other side of it, right, is that prices need to go up. There will be fewer jobs because there will be fewer customers because the products will be more expensive. So we also need to just have realistic expectations that that really good jobs mean also total a, a total less work. <laughs> there, it's a lot, basic economics, elasticity of price, uh, and so we need to then solve for other solutions for solving for that, which might be things like Adrian just talked about in, in a public scenario. But I think that's where I really think this conversation is actually the, the most complex part of it is that it's actually easy to say, well, we need to solve benefits or we need to solve, you know, access or we need to solve. But the hard part is like, how do you pay for it all? And from a company perspective, from a sustainability perspective, um, I think that is actually what, you know, has a lot of trade-offs and, and, and is something that I, I'm not sure has been fully solved or a, a great solution has been put on the table by anyone just yet. Yeah, thanks, Will. Uh, Lexi, I just saw you uh, go off mute. So do you wanna add something about uh, benefits access? Yeah, ju just a brief note on, on what Will said. Um, and I just wanted to raise up the, the Black Car Fund, that model in New York, right? It, it's small, it's just in New York, but as Will noted, you know, that's a surcharge on every ride. The customers are paying for that, but that's ensuring that drivers in New York for over 30 years, I believe, have access to workers' comp if they get injured on the job. You know, that's industry specific. Obviously, different types of gig work that fall within different industries are going to need a different set of protections. But I think that's a that's a model that was mandated by policy, but is being paid for by people using those services that has functioned really successfully in New York for a lot of years. So I think thinking about those kinds of models on a broader scale is what we need to turn to. Thank you. Leah. Yeah, I I think I just, just I think it's important to acknowledge that um, I think many states and many cities across the city are testing different things. And um, and in this testing process, I think there is a lot to figure it out. But I think there's one thing that we have stood by very clearly. We cannot continue to build um, a gig economy at the expenses of workers, right? We, it, it's, it's impossible to think that we can, we can allow gig companies to continue to, 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 to test their business models by putting um, the safety of workers at risk um, without having, and I think the big example is here, um, some of, in New York, one of the deadliest industries that few people talk about happens to be app delivery workers. Um, in the last three years, there has been more than 30 workers that have died doing this work without their families um, having access to health um, economic relief to being able to uh, bear their families to workers who got injured and having to, I think, uh, go to public hospitals to try to like get access. I think we need to figure out a solution and something that I agree with Will, this is not, we need to bring everybody to the table. Um, businesses, we need to bring government to the table. We need to bring worker advocates to figure it out what's the right way um, to make sure that workers get protected from getting basic leave, from making sure they have access to workers' comp, to health insurance. Um, and, you know, we rethink about sustainability. It's about making sure workers 
are it's not at the expenses of workers. Um, in New York, we have been very clear if if big delivery companies like GrabHub, DoorDash, Uber wants to stay in our city, it can be by paying sub minimum wages. Um, and it can be about um, saying that the solution is to deactivate workers, right? Or or to lay off workers. Um, and what we are asking is let's sit at the table, let's have a conversation. Even deliveristas in New York would say, we wanna to talk to the companies. We want the gig economy to thrive, but it cannot be at the expenses of workers. And talking about model, it's a, it's something we need to, It's we're, I don't think there has been a lot of effort to try to figure out what's the right model, but there is really good organizing and really good even, I think, uh, companies who want to be at the table, um, and we're excited because I think this is this is this is a long process, and this is about the future of not only gig work but all workers across the country. We hear, I mean, not 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 to be overly provocative, and with all due respect, I just think I think that that is a, a really hard line, you know, to say that we need this and it can't have any any impact. The reality is that you know we we instituted we I, I use that broad term. I wasn't part of this uh, minimum wage law for drivers in New York City. The only way that that works from a company perspective is that I can't allow you to work anytime you want if I don't have demand to pay you during that time. So reasonably, the the companies that you know work that have services in New York, when you have a minimum wage, they limit the times in which you can work. And you need to sign up for shifts, and you need to, and and you can't work at a period of time when there isn't enough demand to support the pay that is that's required to be paid to meet minimum wage. That that is a again, I mean, that's just a realistic trade off that we need to, I believe, be more transparent about. And whether that is, you know, a, if you would consider that a. Uh, you know, uh, an impact on workers or not, I'm not sure, but I think that that anything we do will have, um, you know, <laughs> in physics, each action has an equal and opposite reaction. And, and I think that that's, that there's just no way to move forward by saying we, we are not going to move because if we, everybody needs to move, everybody needs to be willing to, to, to be open about the trade-offs and, and decide, what set of trade-offs is best for the collective? Yeah, we've talked a lot about this, this fact of trade-offs, the reality of trade-offs. And to Lihia's point, you know, workers have been on the losing end of so many trade-offs okay. for a long time. Yes, um, I think that that we also can agree with, which is that, you know, that that for for a lot of reasons, um it, it's easier for for workers to be used uh in a bad way and 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 what we're doing at alto and i think what everybody around this this table and the call wants to do is is prevent that um but i just want to bring the kind of the business perspective of yeah we, we we need to improve we need to force improvement but it does take it does take compromise ultimately yeah one of the potential models that has come up in the audience questions a few times is uh worker cooperatives and worker ownership um and we're just about time to switch to our conclusion but i do want to see if uh, any of our panelists have have any quick remarks on worker co-ops as a possible uh path forward i have a strong per uh, perspective but i'm i'm happy to shut up and let others talk how about adrian i saw you go off mute do you want to jump in yeah, Lihia and I are really good friends with this guy named Eric Foreman, who started something in New York called the Drivers Co-op. Um, uh, these are uh, these are drivers in New York working on a 1099, but Will and the workers there have found a way um, to respect that distinction by also um, uh, giving folks things like benefits that they pay into as part of their ownership stake um, that, that offer dignity. <laughs> and so it's a really good model. I will say Eric Foreman and the workers in New York who are part of this have uh, are changing my mind um, about the scale potential for uh, co-ops just generally, right? They're so local and so community driven in most cases that it's hard. And I know that they're about to expand into Colorado um, and have a really, and we've been uh, partners with them since 
um, since they were talking about this as a moonshot. And now I think um, they've, uh, they may have cracked a nut that I think is going to uh, uh, be really helpful, uh, not just in New York, but uh, in, Co in Colorado for sure. Thank you, Adrian. Um, and now as a way of closing out um, and to give everyone one opportunity for a last word, we're gonna do a quick lightning round. Um, so stay super quick, 30 seconds or less, preferably less. Uh, and we'll all be recognizing Labor Day in just a few weeks, um, a day not about the end of summer, but to celebrate and recognize contributions of workers to this country. Um, so what is one thing that people can do to recognize gig workers this Labor Day? Uh, Will, I'm going to start with you. Uh, I'll be at the U.S. Open in New York, and we'll be uh, taking care of um, all the bartenders that are going to be there uh, helping support my um, my uh, participation and celebration of that weekend. Great. Uh, Lexi, how about you? I uh, was going to be a policy question last. Um, <laughs> this is a pivot. Uh, yeah, I think, um, yeah, tip any workers that you engage with. Um, big tips over the weekend. We know that so little of the fairs are often going to workers. So please, you know, make that up in tips. And if they were going to support a policy idea, what would it be? I, I have my, my policy thing is that we need a good accounting of this work. Um, we need a, we need a way to register and understand this work. So even if employers don't want to be on record, we need a way to actually account for all the work that's happening. And I think that's the first policy that leads to policies around benefits, workplace protections, minimum wage, all of that. Thank you. Adrian? I would say I, I'm just gonna I echo I'm gonna echo Lexi's and double it. I'm raising the thing here as if we're playing cards. Um, double whatever tip you were gonna give, double it. I dare everybody on Labor Day. And Lihia, last not least, what can folks do to recognize gig workers this Labor Day? Uh, well, I I would say um, I was gonna say tip, but also give good ratings. Um, uh, whether you food comes cold uh, or maybe not on time, uh, it's not the worker's fault. Just just make sure you give a good rating. And the other one is joined uh, our uh, consumer justice, uh, consumers delivering justice campaign. I put the link there. Um, we are, we're, our goal is to build a partnership with consumers who have a lot uh, power to transform the industry. Thank you again to Adrian, Will, Lexi, and Lihia for a great conversation. Uh, stay tuned for more information on our next event on September 12th, a book talk with Marjorie Kelly on her latest book, Wealth Supremacy, How the Extractive Economy and the Biased Rules of Capitalism Drive Today's Crises. Uh, thanks very much also to Maureen Conway for her dedicated support and leadership on these conversations, and to all of my colleagues at Aspen's Economic Opportunities Program for their support on this event, uh, including Matt Helmer, Colleen Cunningham, Amanda Finns, Maya Smith, Merit Stuven, Frances Aldemovar, Sinan Young, Bryn Morgan, Tony Mestria, and Nora Heffernan. Uh, and thanks so much to all of our audience for joining and sharing your questions, comments, and insights. Uh, please do take a moment to respond to our quick feedback survey. Uh, it'll open in your web browser when you leave this event. Uh, and you can also send us an email at eop.program at aspeninstitute.org to let us know what you think. Uh, we love to hear from you, and we really hope you'll join us again. Thanks again. <laughs>